Your Bibles are hopefully creased to that book by now, Philippians chapter 4. As an expositor of the word, I, I preach exegetically and, and in order like this. So if I stop at verse 6, then in verse 7 next week, I'm going to pick up and begin. So Philippians chapter 4, starting, um, let's just start there in, uh, in uh, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4 of Philippians, I'll read to 9. It says, um, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. The most reverend R.C. Trench, who was at one time the Protestant Archbishop of Dublin, had a morbid fear of becoming paralyzed. Uh, one evening at a, at a house party, uh, the lady he sat next to at dinner heard him muttering mournfully to himself, and this is what he was saying underneath his breath, it's happened at last, total insensibility of the right limb, in which the lady says, your grace, it may comfort you to learn that it's my leg you are pinching. I was expecting a different response. It creeps over us. It entangles us, it traps us, it creates instability. Worry, anxiety, stress. There are over 100 diseases related to and have been diagnosed resulting from worry. A Christian psychiatrist says, and I quote, anxiety is the most common mental disorder they encounter at their network of clinics across our country. We often feel anxious and worried about things, don't we? Um, finances, there's a good one. How are we going to feel uh, for this month's bills? Uh, what happens if I lose my job? How are we going to pay the doctor? How are we going to put our kids through college? How are we going to save for retirement? What happens if the stock market crashes? What about the economy? What happens if the cost of the dollar goes down, et cetera, et cetera? That probably already put fear in your heart, right? You're already starting to have a little anxiety. We worry about children. Um, will our children make good choices? Will they make good friends? Will they avoid drugs? Will they avoid sexual immorality? Will they finish school well? Will they do well in their classes? Will they go to college and get a good degree? Will they close off to the world? Will they become lonely? Will they get a good career? Will they stay safe on the road while they're driving? Will they be safe in a crime-infested world? Will they have good families? Yeah, more exciting. You guys feel that? We worry about our health. Uh, how will we deteriorate when we get older? Will we get an incurable disease? Will we have to be put in a nursing home? Will you lose your hearing, your eyesight? Can I perform jobs well and functions well? What's going to happen? By so worry, anxiety, stress it creeps up. It's all around us. It's prevalent. And you know what? All these are signs of instability instability anxiety and worry let's just face it is a sin we do not look at it as a sin but it is worry is actually defined as this and i quote a troubled state of mind resulting from concern about current or potential difficulties it actually comes from an old english word meaning to strangle such as a wolf killing a sheep it, it grab it up by the neck and eventually strangle that sheep to death by strangling with its mouth around the neck of the sheep. So how do we become not entangled in worry, anxiety? How can we stand firm? What is the remedy of not falling into such a binding and trapping emotion? What can we do to stop 
anxiety and worry from creeping into our lives. Well, this is the third Sunday uh, that we've been going through verses 1 through 9 of chapter 4 in Philippians chapter 4. And um, we've been looking at this statement, true believer must possess these seven attributes in order to stand firm with a spiritual stability. A true believer must possess. As I said, I take careful thought of each word, and that is pretty strong language. A true believer must possess these seven attributes in order to stand firm with spiritual stability. So if there's a place in your life where you're spiritually unstable, unstable, if there's a place where you falter or fail at, if we line ourselves up with these seven attributes, I think we can find our place where we're unstable at. Here's the timeless truth. It was timeless then, it's timeless now. A spiritually unstable believer is unaffected in their witness and a danger to the body of Christ. It's like you get a cut on the arm, something's bleeding on your arm, your body says we need to take care of that cut and heal it and, get, and, and, and heal it right away. It's the same way with the body of Christ. This should motivate all true believers to stand firm on the truth and to work diligently on these attributes. And if you look at verse 1 of Philippians 4, this is how we get to these seven attributes. Verse four, 1 of verse 4 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. Paul made it known in chapter 3 that we maximize our bodies to run a race, to run the race of sanctification. And what is sanctification? Becoming more and more and more and more and more and more like Jesus every day. That's the short of sanctification. Always striving to become like Jesus. That's the goal, to become like Jesus. The prize is being like Jesus when we get our glorified bodies. That's what it is. So he's saying here in chapter 4, stand firm so we can be more like Jesus. Well, how do we stand firm, Paul? How do we stand firm? Stand firm in the Lord, he says. Okay. But in what way do we stand firm in the Lord? And there's a cute little Greek word right before it. It means in this way or so or thus. Your different translations might uh, read it differently. I like the way the New American Standard uh, does it. In this way, stand firm. He says, in this way, stand firm. And then he proceeds on going through seven attributes of how to do it. He's like, in this way, do it. Here's the seven attributes. Seven qualities of a true believer. And the first attribute, if you remember, that we went through was peace. And I've been going over it and uh, recollecting with the youth on Wednesday nights a little bit about this. I really, really want this to seep into our lives, into our souls. It's basically the essence of who we are as believers. The first one is peace. In verse 2, Paul points out two women who are fighting and squabbling. And he says, knock it off, get the problem resolved. And he calls upon the church to help with them with the issue. He says it's creating much discord. These two ladies have now made a cut in the body of Christ. And the body needs to heal the cut. So let's take care of it. Their quarreling was divisive and is disunifying. Now here's the caveat to there. If it's a doctrinal issue, okay, let's talk about it. But if it's something with style or preference or, or someone's feet getting stepped on or et cetera, et cetera, that's just being divisive. That's just being quarrelsome to be quarrelsome. He says, we have none of that. That's being a cut on the arm. Get it fixed up. The first attribute, peace, harmony. True believer. If there's no peace in your life, you're unstable. You're unstable. Verse 4, Paul gives the second attribute. He says joy, must possess joy. He repeats it twice for emphasis. He's like, rejoice. In the Lord. Oh, did you hear me? I said rejoice in the Lord. It's kind of the, uh, the, the connotation behind it. He's like rejoice in the Lord. Oh, you didn't hear me. Rejoice again, I say. So rejoice, joy. And if you remember, last week I went through a very lengthy illustration in the book of Habakkuk, if you remember. And uh, what did we end up concluding at the end of Habakkuk? is he needed to understand the sovereignty of God. When you understand that God's sovereign, when the whole natural world can be crumbling around you, when those wicked Chaldeans are being rising up and, and, and plundering and looting and wiping everyone up off the, the, the face of the map, you, got, you can't just shake your fist at God because God has never made a, whoops, I didn't see that one coming. So you've got to understand the sovereignty of God. 
And when you understand the sovereignty of God, you're like, well, the whole world can fall around me. Uh, people can throw stuff at me, can say bad things about me, can do whatever they want. I rest, and I'll still have joy in my salvation because I know that he's still on the throne. So for that, I can rejoice. So there's the second one. If you don't have joy in your life, you're unstable. Third attribute was gracious humility. Verse 5 says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Let your forbearance, your magnanim magnanimity, uh, that's the King James Version, by the way. Magnan magnanimity, I said it once. Your graciousness is basically what it is. As I was reviewing this with the youth on, on Wednesday, uh, we came up with a lot of list of self sins. Do you remember that, guys? Self sins. And we had selfish, we had self glory, we had self image, self absorbed, uh, self gratifying, self pleasing, a lot of self stuff. All going back to what? What, is, what did my dad always say growing up? Uh, if he was here, he'd tell me, You got eye trouble. You got an eye problem. Uh, it's gracious humility. It's all about self. It's uh, hu uh, gracious humility is the opposite of it. Basically, it means this. You may uh, offend me. You may mistreat me. You may misjudge me. You may misrepresent me. You may maltreat me. You may not give me what I deserve. You may have given me what I deserve. You may have ruined my reputation. You may have acted hostile. You may be unjustly against me, but I humbly, graciously accept it. That is spiritual stability. It's when you say, I have no rights. It doesn't matter. You can step on me. You can kick me. You can throw me. You can do whatever you want. I graciously and humbly accept it, is what it's saying. It's spiritual stability. It's not about you, is what you're saying. It's not about my rights. It's not about my pride. It's saying, God has been so graciously to me, and what he has done for me, the least I can do is to model that and give it back to others. If you don't have gracious humility, if you do go after the self-will, the, the self-sins, you're spiritually unstable. Number three. So this morning, let's look at a couple more. Let's look at a couple more of these attributes. In order to be a, to stand firm as a true believer, number four, a true believer must possess faith. Faith. We saw that one coming. Uh, we need to have this one. As I started this sermon um, I said we worry a lot, right? We have a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of stuff for us to get consumed about, to worry about. And if we're not careful, uh, uh, all this stuff around us will drive us to worry, to anxiety. Children, health, aging, etc. As I got to reading these verses, once again, I started to think, what do we have to do or have to have to not have anxiety? What needs to take place in our life so we do not worry to have anxiety? That'd be the question that would flow through my mind. What needs to happen so I do not have to spend any more time or waste any more time worrying about stuff? That'd be, that'd be a great, great answer to find out. So. Look at these verses. Let's start at the end of verse 5, and it'll go into verse 6. This is what we need to have. The Lord is near, it says. Be anxious for nothing. nothing. Stop. Okay. In that little phrase, the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing, is loaded. Is loaded. I'm going to do my best to make it through this first point. But I really, really want to emphasize this point. The answer is you need faith. You need a deep loving, sold-out, solid faith. In order not to worry or not to have anxiety, you need faith. Okay, well, I have faith. I trust in God. Okay. All right, let's go through this. All right, let's, let's just line ourselves up with this attribute for a moment and just see how deep that faith is. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, if you recall, he says in uh, chapter 6 of Matthew, starting in verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. 
They don't go shopping. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Here's the cool part. Are you not worth much more than they? Don't you think we're a little bit above the birds? He takes care of the birds. And then verse 27, and who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Like, what will worry get you? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown to the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? And here it is. This is where he socks us in the jaw. You of little what? Faith. Faith. There it is. You of little faith. We need faith. When you have worry and anxiety, you are unstable. You're spiritually unstable. George, George Moeller said this, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. He gets it. Arthur Summers says this, anxiety is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. A poll was taken by Barna Research Group, and it states this, an average person's anxiety is focused on this, 40% on things that will never happen, 30% on things about the past that can't be changed, 12% things about criticism by others, mostly untrue, 10% about health, which gets worse with stress, 8%. 8% about real problems that will be faced. 8%. 8%. Listen, it's no hidden secret that the world is full of trouble and turmoil. In fact, Scripture promises that we'll see turmoil. In Job um, 14.1, it says, Man who is born of a woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. So it's going to happen. And then we know John 16.33, Jesus even promises, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage. I've overcome the world. So it's going to happen. Troubles and trials are going to hit us. It's going to happen. Let's take a closer look at a minute there at verse 5 as I unpack this a little bit more. It says, the Lord is near. There's the Greek word egus. Egus, it can mean either near in space or near in time. For example, um, there's the drum set is near to me, right? So that's near in space. We can say um, Monday is near. That's near in time. So what context is Paul looking at here when he uses this word? It is strongly to be understood that um, since Christ is living in us, he is near to us in space. He's here with us. So do not be anxious. Do not be unstable. Do not be wavering. Do not collapse, break down, or flip out. The Lord is what? Near is near. He's near in space. He's with us. Verse 6 continues, be anxious for nothing. And the word for nothing is uh, medes. It literally means not even one thing. So do not worry, not even for one thing is what it's saying, literally. It's an imperative. It's a command, meaning we can't question it. We can't uh, hyperbole it. We, it's, it's right there, written Nothing equals nothing, so we are to worry about nothing. How much is nothing? It's nothing. Uh, well, you might be saying, you know, Michael, I don't think you understand. You don't understand the pressure I'm under. You don't understand the devastation I've been through. You don't understand all the things, the life that's swirling around me. You don't understand uh, about the ulcer and the heartburn that I have. And, you know, I have to worry. It's part of my life to worry. It's my job to worry. It's, it's my job to worry about my job. It's my job to worry about my family. Um, but the verse says, be anxious for a few things that are really tough, but not the simple things. That's what the verse says. No, it says, be anxious for nothing, not even one thing, not a zilch zero. Don't be worried. That's, it's, it's, it's as literal as could be. You can't twist it any other way. Don't worry about anything. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Okay, Let's go through another portion of the Old Testament. Uh, if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter uh 21, we'll see a cool little story uh, that's been placed here. 
I've been getting you guys a little bit into the Old Testament. We've been sitting in the New Testament long enough. So I've been trying to, you can't, here it is. I'm just going to give you guys a little tip, a little preaching tip for free. Um, all my illustrations, if I mention an illustration, illustrates my point. So if you can remember my illustrations, you can remember my point. And one um, good piece of wisdom that my preaching professor always told me is, if you can illustrate it with scripture, illustrate it with scripture. So that's, that's typically one of my first illustrations I try to go to, is something really, really cool from scripture to illustrate the point that I'm trying to illustrate from scripture. Make sense? Good. So in 1 Samuel 21, it says this, David is fleeing from Saul, and it starts in verse 10. It says, and then David rose and fled that day from Saul, and went to Achish, king of Gath. What is happening is David is looking for refuge. He needs to get out of town. So he goes over to the next uh, region in Phil Phil Philistia. Philist mm -hmm. Philistia, there it is, uh, looking for some kind of asylum from Saul. He's trying to escape. He's trying to find comfort, refuge from Saul. But look at what happens in verse 11 as he enters Gath, and King Achish is the king over Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul is slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? So David is running from protection. And he runs to Achish, and the servants of Achish says, Listen, you think Saul was a foe? <laughs> he only killed thousands. He's just a punk compared to this warrior. This warrior killed tens of thousands. So when David hears that, he panics. He panics. And David comes up with a plan to get out of there. Now he has to flee from Achish, king of Achish. So in verse 13, look at what happens. So he disguised his sanity before them, and he acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. So he acted like a complete madman. He went berserk. He snapped. He acted crazy and insane. He was scribbling on the doors of the gate, saliva running down to his beard. And by the way, that was desecration of maleness is what that was, the, the saliva running through the beard. So he was just acting like a complete, utter fool, an idiot, trying to escape. So why did David act this way? If you got to think in all the way up to now, what has David witnessed? Has he not witnessed God's awesome power and strength with Goliath? Had he forgotten how God had protected him? Had David forgot about God's hand on his life as king? Has he not forgotten about all the uh, protection God has given him with Saul? Here's what happened. He got scared. He worried. He had anxiety. He got unstable. He was fearful. He tried to take things in his own hands, and he snapped is what he did. And look what happens in verse 14. This is, this is actually quite humorous if you look at this. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why did you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen? He said, Isn't there not enough crazy people around here? And you bring me another crazy person? I don't want any more crazy people. Get the crazy people out, is what he's saying. He said, Don't bring him to me. So David plans work. He gets off the hook. He still has to run from Saul, but he gets off the hook with Achish. So David escapes, and he runs over to the cave of Adom. And at this time, according to historical notation, if you flip to Psalm 57, you'll, you'll take a look at, at what David writes after he's done all this. In Psalm 57, Psalm 57, you'll understand what David is thinking about in the cave. And this is what he's thinking about. Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I'll take refuge until destruction passes by. I'll cry to the Most High, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory above all the earth. They have been prepared a net for my steps. My soul is, borrow, is bowed down. They dug a bit pit before me. They themselves have fallen to the midst of it. My heart is steadfast. Here it is. He gets it finally. He starts running through theology proper again in his mind. He's starting to think about who God is. 
He's starting to understand the sovereignty of God. He's starting to understand that God is still on the throne. He's starting to understand, man, I was a complete idiot back there in Akesh. And he says, my heart is steadfast, O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I'll sing, yes, I'll sing praises. Awake my glory, awake harp and lyre. I'll awaken the dawn. I'll give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I'll sing praises to you among the nations, for your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O oh God. Let your glory be above all the earth. So his senses come back to him. He's like, yeah, I, I took things on my own. I worried, I panicked, I freaked, I flipped out. Instead of relying upon the sovereignty of God. So David is sitting in that cave putting his theology back in order. He talks about all the great stuff about God and how he remembered this stuff back when he was in Gath. Maybe I shouldn't have acted like that in front of the king. But this is what we get to thinking. This is the way we live our lives. Our, th our theology works on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday we flip out. We freak. We traumatize. We let the drool run through our beards, metaphorically speaking. So how are we to empty ourselves of worry? Here are the things that we need to remember. God first cares about what we face in life. He cares. He really, really cares. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. He sympathizes with us. Christ has been through it. First Peter 5, 7, we know this one. Cast all your cares, all your anxiety on him. For what? He cares for you. He cares for you. God cares about what we face. He cares about our struggles, our worries, our, our trials. And then here's the second part. Not only does he care, but God has promised to take care of you. He has promised to take care of you. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? That's what he's saying. When we understand that the Lord is near, the Lord is abiding in us, that he cares for us, that he sympathizes with our weaknesses, that he's sovereign and in control. It is easy, easy to throw our cares onto him because he cares. He cares about what we face, and he's promised to take care of us. And that is what we rest our hats on. He's promised it. So let's not worry about nothing. Okay. Well, this is what I'm going to do. Um, if you thought that point was long, the second point here is going to be even a little bit longer. So uh, instead of breezing through it, I'm just going to save that point for next week. We're just going to take our time through it. Why not? Why not? I'm a slow preacher. Um, yeah. We're just going to leave that point for next week, and we'll just see that next week's anxiety. I don't want to breeze through that. I can't emphasize enough, really, how important these attributes are. Um, the application is to continually have these on the heart and the mind. Working diligently in these areas. And so far where we have seen peace, joy, humility, and faith. If we were to line ourselves up to those four points right now, individually, and say, where am I with peace, joy, humility, and faith? And if there's any part in there where we are lacking, any part in there where we fail, any part in there where we don't add up to what Scripture has been showing to us, we're unstable. We're unstable. You know, as I was going through these, um, you know, I, I've been sitting in this passage for, uh, see, this is the third week preaching. It's been second, at least five weeks now. Five weeks I have been reading verses one through nine over and over and over. Um, 
And the more I look at it, it becomes more and more evident that these attributes show the true character of the redeemed. Uh, it follows the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Right? How do you know that you're a Christian? How do you know that someone's a Christian? With the Spirit indwelling inside them, you're going to see fruit. And what is the fruit in, in Galatians 5? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, humility, graciousness, self-control. And all those attributes can be put right in line with these attributes that we're talking about. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It shows the mark of a true believer. Remember, what is evident in your heart comes out. Watch over your heart, is what Proverbs says, with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Your life, listen, is a product on how you think about God, is what it is. You become what you think. You're thinking, I want to be a great soccer player. And that is all that goes through your mind, how to train for soccer, how to be soccer, how to do the moves in soccer, you become soccer itself. That's what you've devoted your life to. That's what you want to do. That's who you become. So the product of what you think is always being manifested through you. So your outlook on life, who you become, when you're squeezed and what is being produced in your fruit and your actions and your thoughts and your attitudes is all about what you think about God is what it is. Are you a true believer with what you see that comes out of you? It's all about how you think about God. Do you think he is sovereign? Do you think he's almighty that's on the throne? Do you follow his example of gracious humility? Is your faith so bound up with him that nothing else matters? Or when all of nature goes berserk, and it looks like the world is falling around you. Are you going to have your faith grounded in him? Or are you going to just drool down your beard and act like a crazy, batty, delirious, demented, deranged madman? It's a command to be spiritually stable. It's a command to stand firm. Anything else is disobedience. So if you're disobeying God, that's basically meaning saying, you know what, you're not the true God. There's another God. And that's a form of blasphemy. So these attributes are how you stand firm. Firm. I say that with all love, but I want to stress it enough to the point where it just seeps in us and that we understand the scriptures for where we are. I, I believe, you know, a, a major problem with you know, society and churches in itself is that we don't get down to this hard stuff and look at it for what scripture says to look at it for and just dwell on these things. Do we dwell on the thoughts, precepts, commands, promises of God so that it's just flowing through our mind, that it seeps into our heart so when things happen, it comes out in our actions and attitude? All starts with the mind. One day, Bramwell Booth went to his aged father and his father was groping for sight and told uh, the old general, the son did that, the doctor said that they'd do more for his, they couldn't do any more for his eyes. In which the father replied, so do you mean that I am blind and must remain blind? I fear it is so, he says. Shall I never see your face again? The father asked. No, probably not in this world. The general moved out his hand until he felt and clasped the hand of his son. He said, God must know best. I have done what I could for God and the people with my eyes. Now I should do what I can for God and the people without my eyes. Faith. Faith. Standing firm. Standing firm in faith. When the world crumbles around you, when things and trials happen, standing firm. What an attitude. Even though things happen and are tough and seem unfair, uh, we stand firm. Knowing God is sovereign, God is on the throne, God has a perfect plan by grace and faith, we stand firm and move on. Because why? 
we're spiritually stable. Father, I pray that as we um, stop this morning at this point in passage, that that it just seeps into our lives, into our hearts, um, about these attributes, about peace, peace in our lives, about joy in our lives, about uh, gracious humility. We can easily go through and look at stuff and say, I've been wronged in this area, or I've someone's hurt me in this area, or my pride's been stepped on in this area. And we can easily go through and find something like that. It's not the way you were. It's not the way you modeled. It's not the way you've taught us. Faith, how deep our faith is, that we don't just let things just spin out of control. We take things in our own hands and we just act like, like mad people trying to figure things out, trying to find the solutions. But we stand firm, solid. Father, you know our hearts. Forgive us where we have fallen short of your glory and we mess up. We are human and we're trying we're trying our best. May your may we continually dwell on the promises, precepts, commands that you have written in scripture so that what is evident in our mind flows to our heart, which flows out in our actions and attitudes. This is your time, Father, in Christ's name.